Hello, welcome to this video. It's called Which Country is to Blame for World War I, Part 1. Well, that was 108 years ago at the time of this recording. I remember as a child, there were people alive that were in that war, the men in their 70s, mostly, you know. I never remember any of them talking about it. Don't remember too many talking about World War II, although more would talk about the Second World War. But I guess I wasn't too close to the guys that were so old or, and myself. But then by the 1980s, they were in 90s, they were all mostly had died off, died away, just like World War II now, most of them have died. But I knew a lot about, well, you know, a lot about World War I as a child, much as a child could know. And it was, my understanding was simplistic. Uh, as I got older in my teen years, I got more interested in it trying to find out about it, reading books about it, the First World War, which today is probably more accurate to call it the World War Part One, and then the World War Part Two, and then maybe the World War Part Three, 1944 to the present. But anyway, um, just lifting it up, got tired of sitting. I have two important books that I bought years ago, didn't pay much for them. Uh, this one's called The New Map of Europe, 1911 to 1914, by Herbert Adams Gibbons. And uh, need to, I need to glue it back. Herbert Adam Gibbon, Adams Gibbons, PhD, author of The Foundation of the Ottoman Empire and Parish Reborn. This book was published in 1915. I'm going to fix it. And it's got a map of uh, southeastern Europe, the Balkan states. <laughs> can see here with the glare. I'm just, I'm not going to really go into detail. I mean, you, a book, you got to look at it yourself, showing the changes. So it's the new map of Europe. Uh, this is the third edition, August 1915. And it says, Gift of the People of the United States through the Victory Book Campaign, A-L-A-A-R-C-U-S-O, to the Armed Forces and Merchant Marine. Uh, so, it must have been given out to Americans during the war. <clears throat> so, it's got different chapters, Germany and Alsace and Lorraine, the Weltpolitik of Germany. The Baghdad Bond, Baghdad Bond, it's a proposed highway. Algeciras and Agadir, the passing of Persia, the partitioners and their Poles, Italia Irredenta, the Danube and the Dardanelles, Austria-Hungary and her South Slavs, racial rivalries in Macedonia, the Young Turk regime in the Ottoman Empire, Crete and European diplomacy, the war between Italy and Turkey, the war between the Balkan states and Turkey, the rupture between the Allies, the war between the Balkan allies, when they started fighting with each other, the Treaty of Bucharest, the Albanian fiasco, the Austro-Hungarian ultimatum to Serbia, Germany forces war upon Russia and France. So you can see this person's got an opinion. Germany forces war upon Russia and France. Great Britain enters the war. So uh, this fellow, he decided that uh, Germany is uh, at fault. And it goes into great detail, uh, and but you'd have to read the book. And I read this book, and I'm going to read it again because it's been about 25 years, 30 years since I read it. It's got really good maps, maps of Africa, color maps, uh, no color photos. I don't remember that being in the book. Um, Belgium and German frontier, very important map. And um, other maps. Okay, Europe in 1914. I'm about to show you that map on a screen share. And they've got some um, official documents here, too, which are very important. But an even more important book is called 
uh, The Story of the Great War, Volume 2. I'd like to get Volume 1. And this the feature of this volume is Diplomatic and State Papers by P.F. Collier and Sons. So this book, and it's showing a photo of uh, Austin Knight, Rear Admiral of the United States. Just, they're just showing him, no real particular reason. Um, this book, written, uh, published in 1916, provides state papers and documents. I guess all the countries at war provided copies of that to uh, publishing companies to state their case, say, oh, this is, we're not wrong, they're wrong, they're not wrong, we're, you know, we're not wrong, they're wrong, and so forth. State papers, and it goes through all the state papers, and I read this book a second time. It's got actual first-hand, you know, primary sources, which I always want to use primary sources, not what this might say about it, but what did they say? Okay, so let's go into a little detail. As far as we can go, I got to put the phone on silent. Okay, okay we're on silent. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's look at the map because that is where you got to start. <clears throat> That adjusted there. Tears off work. Uh, okay. I'm just going to post the comments so I don't have to read them again. People can read them at their leisure. Yes. I'm going to try to do that. But let's uh, go to the share screen. Now, you look at the map, you see the United Kingdom in the northwest, northwestern Europe, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Then you see the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, it used to be all one country, single country at one time, the Netherlands, but uh, that changed. You see the German Empire ruled by Prussia, basically the, the Second Reich which doesn't include all of the original German Reich, which was, uh, here you see Prague, that's the capital of the Kingdom of Bohemia, that was included, Bohemia and Moravia, what we call the Czech Republic today was included in the original German Empire, the First Reich, the Holy Roman Empire and the German Confederation, but uh, they were expelled. So you see they're just part of Austro, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Can you see Austria down below, Vienna, the capital, Salzburg, Linz, other Austrian cities. Remember, Austria used to extend deep into what is Italy today. And then you see Switzerland. I don't know how you call it Switzerland. This could be a European-produced map. Then you see the French Republic, Italy, the Kingdom of Italy. You see Corsica Island, which was seized by France from Genoa an Italian state long back in the 1760s. France never gave it back. Kingdom of Spain, Portugal out there in southwestern Europe. Spanish Morocco, they still own two parts of that today, 2022. French Africa there. Italian uh, Libya there. British controlled Egypt. They didn't own Egypt, but they uh, it was actually part of the Ottoman Empire in a technical sense, in legal sense, but they had control of it. Then you see uh, British Cyprus. They still have two territories there today in 2022, I might add. Then you see Greece and the Ottoman Empire, which at that time was a huge empire stretching from Europe to what we call today Syria, Lebanon, Iraq. Western Arabia down to Yemen, Yemen, and uh, also Eastern Arabia with that nominal control, a little bit of control. Can you see Persia or Iran? 
kingdom of the Persian Empire. Not much of an empire, but that's what they called it. Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, Montenegro, Albania, only independent since 1912. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, you see that. And then you see the huge Russian Empire, which is too big for the map. <clears throat> and then you have Finland, notice, is part of the Russian Empire. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, also part of Russia at the time. Poland, split between Russia, Germany, and Austria. Southern Poland, owned by Austria. Central and Eastern Poland, owned by Russia. And Western Poland, owned by Germany. There was no official country called Poland at the time. Although there was a Polish nation, the tribe of the Polish people, the Polish nation. See, the Kingdom of Sweden, who owned Norway until 1905, but that was another story for another day, when Norway seceded from the Kingdom of Sweden. Sweden. Denmark, or Denmark, as they say over there in those countries, Denmark, who's smaller then than they are today because they had lost Schleswig and Holstein to Germany in a war in 1864 that Denmark was foolishly baited into joining, uh, baiting, baited into starting. They, you know, remember the master conspirator um, Otto von Bismarck, he wanted to unite Germany into a new empire, un naturally under his kingdom's control, meaning Prussia. And you notice Prussia stretches from the Baltic Sea out here by Königsberg, all the way west to the Netherlands, the biggest kingdom in Germany. But he had to unite it by using war, but he was careful about it. He was, uh, that's evil, we'll agree, it's evil to use war, but he did it. First, they go after Denmark, baiting them to attack. They got them out of there because Denmark owned that state, those two states, Schleswig and Holstein, inside of Germany. <laughs> so they got rid of them. Then he conspired to get rid of Austria, the, the second strongest country in the German Confederation, by causing a lot of trouble with them over Schleswig and Holstein and baited Austria into attacking him, meaning Prussia, in 1866. And they defeated Austria in a war that lasted only seven weeks. And Austria was expelled from the German Confederation along with Liechtenstein, Siva Dues there, in Central Europe, capital of the tiny state of Liechtenstein. But that was, you know, it didn't matter. It was so, that's like a county in the United States. And then uh, the third step was to, and this leads to World War I, you see, the third step was to expel France from Alsace and Lorraine. You see the word Luxembourg, Luxembourg, however you want to spell it. Between Luxembourg and Switzerland is Alsace and Lorraine, the middle kingdom left over from the, the Charlemagne's empire. Lutheran, Lutheran, uh, named after Lothair, and uh, but it didn't amount to much except the southern part, which became Italy. But that's a long story. But uh, France had seized Alsace and Lorraine from Germany in 1648 during a German civil war, which lasted 30 years, and the French jumped in at the last few years of the war to grab that territory which the Germans considered was very bad form because they said, you know, we were having a civil war and all of these other outside countries jumped in to grab stuff while we were in our desperate situation. And we don't go for that. But we have a long memory and we're going to fix it up later. So in 1870, Bismarck, the Germ German, uh, the Prussian, chancellor or we would call it prime minister in english the chancellor baited france with their sort of bumbling emperor although not totally terrible but 
he was a bit of a troublemaker, but uh, but bumbling. We can't go into all of that. Uh, Napoleon the Third Bonaparte, Phil, uh, Louis Napoleon. So Emperor Louis Napoleon, Napoleon the Third, attacked Germany, and they lost. The Germans counterattacked, which was what the plan was all along, because they figured they'd beat France. They knew France had a lot of internal problems, and all the German states teamed up, except for Austria, who was not invited to this to the party. And they defeated France, occupied Paris, made France pay enormous reparations, and they annexed Alsace and Lorraine, or as Germany said, reacquired it, land which had been stolen from them <coughs> about 200 years before. Now you say, well, what does that got to do with all this? Well, it has a lot to do with it. Now let's go back to the... Uh, comments for a moment. The Whiskey Scout. The World War II Museum in Kansas City is a great place with lots of great exhibits. Russian Bolsheviks and German imperialists with a bit of Turkish Ottoman Empire are my choice of antagonists for World War I. Mm. But now remember, the Bolsheviks did not seize power in Russia until 1917. So it was the Tsarist. Remember, it was Russia under the Romanov dynasty who was, uh, in, if, if, if Russia is responsible for World War I, and there's a lot of uh, indictment against them, it would be the uh, Tsar Nicholas II, the Romanov dynasty, not the Bolsheviks, who, of course, didn't mind the war starting. They, they were very happy it started. The Ottoman Empire, well, of course, they had nothing to do with the war, but they were very stupidly convinced to join it. In other words, they... But that's another topic. They should have stayed out of that at all costs, but they didn't have a whole lot of good sense. Oh, thank you, Butch. All right, so let's go back to the map. And then we'll have to do a part two at one point in the future, hopefully not too far in the future. So, so this is the situation. We got the German Empire established in 1871, only since 1871. Because all these different little states, you might see the gray lines, were independent countries, but united in a common uh, confederation, the German confederation, which had a, a diet, or we would call it a congress that would meet from time to time. So it was a semi-union, but not a complete full, it wasn't a nation state. It was a confederation of nation state, of, of states. It was all one nation, the German nation, with some Slavs thrown in, <laughs> you know, Czechs and the Czechs. But um, uh, you got Italy, which had only been united as a country in 1860. Italy, like Germany, was one nation, the Italian people. They all spoke Italian or different dialects, like Germany had different dialects. But uh they were divided into many different states. Imagine if it was the United States, everybody spoke English, but they, each state was its own country and they didn't get along and they had their own armies and would fight all the time. So that's what Italy's problem was. The only part of Italy that was united was Southern Italy, uh, which was the kingdom of the two Sicilies, Sicily Island and Southern Italy, Naples down to Sicily was a single kingdom. But the rest of Italy was a jumble of, looked like a jigsaw puzzle. Even today in 2022, there's still still two Italian states that refuse to join Italy. San Marino, which is about the size of a county in the United States, and the Vatican City, which is about the size of a neighborhood, but it's its own independent country, believe it or not. Okay. So we've got Great Britain in the Northwest, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, <laughs> sorry, Ireland which had an empire all around the world, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, about half of Africa, some of South America, a good chunk of the Caribbean Sea, and many Pacific Islands and Indian, uh, Indian Ocean Islands and Atlantic Islands, plus a mainland territory in Europe called Gibraltar down here bottom, you see at the bottom of Spain, which they still own in 2022. They have refused to give it up. And if you look at the location of it, you'll see why. And if you look at the location of Cyprus, you'll see why they refused to give up their two territories there. 
for military purposes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's look at this. We have the German Empire, all German people stretching from Lithuania, well, the Russian Empire at the time, and Poland, the Russian Empire at the time, west to France and, and the, the low countries. They call them the low countries because they're low, they flood a lot. Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Well, not Luxembourg doesn't flood, but it was part of the Netherlands. That's why it's included in that description. Italy to the south, Austria, Hungary to the southeast. And then you got this collection of countries in southeastern Europe who had all been ruled by the Ottoman Empire 100 years previous. So it'd be in 1814, all of these countries were under control of the Ottoman Empire, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro a little bit. Montenegro is a very mountainous country, so they kind of kept their independence up in the mountains. The Ottomans claimed it, but they didn't really have much control over it, but they had some control, but not total. So that was kind of like semi-independent. Albania, Greece, and Cyprus. All of those were Ottoman Turkish territories, okay? That's going to play a part in all of this. And then we got the Russian Empire stretching from Poland in the west to Alaska in the east, the territory of Alaska, and down to Afghanistan, almost to India in the southeast, and China in the southeast. Okay, the biggest country in the world, but mostly empty, except for, you know, animals. Most of the people living in the West. Okie doke. Let's go back to the comments for a moment. It was the Bolshevik influence outside of Russia. It was an idealism that was spreading in its infancy. Well, the Bolshevik communist yeah, the communist ideology had been around since at least in practice, July 14th, 1789, but it started in France. But then, of course, this revolutionary, left-wing revolutionary red, as they call them, the Reds, because they had the red flag, communism wasn't just in France. It spread to Germany, Italy. The United States, Russia, and they wanted a world, world revolution, of course. Let me get some more water. Um, so that's an underlying problem. So that's an underlying problem in the sense that um, none of the ruling country, no, you know, none of the rulers of any of these countries wanted a communist or socialist revolution within their country, because that would mean they'd be out of power. So, uh, yeah. But we want to look at who, what country is to blame. So World War One was the first war fought with chemical warfare. I don't think technically it was, but uh, in a practical major sense, it was. Yeah. Uh -huh. Mustard gas, nerve gas, all was terrible. My nose is itching. All those terrible weapons, yeah. Okay, so um, back to the screen share, to the map. So let's look at the thing. Russia. Now, we really have to go to France first. This is very important. So there's France, the French Republic, and they're in their third republic, the third republic or you could say the third Republican constitution because, uh, this is not supposed to be popping up. Okay. Um, the first Republic was in the 1790s, 1793 to uh, when Napoleon crowned himself emperor. The second Republic was 1848 when Louis Napoleon was 
seized power and said he was the president of France, but then very quickly got himself crowned emperor like his uncle and became Emperor Napoleon. So that was the Second Republic. It only lasted four years. Then the Third Republic in 1870, uh, when Napoleon III was booted out of office, kicked out, and they declared the empire was defunct. Now, in 2022, we're on the Fifth Republic, <laughs> the Fifth Constitution, but that's another story. Okay, uh, so the French owned a big chunk of Africa, or big chunks of Africa, Indian Ocean Islands, Pacific Islands, parts of South America, and many Caribbean islands, and even two islands next to Canada, which they still own in 2022 today. But that's not the problem. Germany had some territories in Africa, Asia, and in the Pacific Ocean also. But that wasn't really the problem either. It really goes back to what was happening in Europe. So let's look at that. Let's go to the Let's look at each thing in part one, and then we're going to go to part two another day. Can't say when. We just want to set the stage. We got France. We know what they're angry about. They're angry about losing Alsace and Lorraine. They can't say that they're afraid of being invaded by Germany because, of course, Germany has no intention to invade France in 1914 because Germany got the land they wanted, and so that's it. They would assume, they would assume, just assume that it remains status quo. Let it stay like it is. We got what we wanted and we have a big empire. So, hey, leave us alone. But France is not satisfied. They're mad, they're angry and they want the land back, but they can't take it back because they know they'll lose. So they need allies. So who do they go to? They go to Germany's Eastern neighbor, Russia. And they make an agreement with Russia in 1894. This is a very foolish move on Russia's part. They make an agreement with Russia in 1894, 95 period, to become allies. That if something goes down with whoever, that they would team up. Now, this is very foolish because there's no way France can really help Russia. And there's no way Russia can really help France, but it's it, they're using it to pressure, you know who, Germany in the middle. Now, this sets off a big, bad chain of events. The German leaders say, oh, OK, this is very bad. Because really, Germany and Russia were natural allies. They're on, they share a, a common border. They both control Poland, who wouldn't have mind breaking away from either one of them, so they had that in common. They're both big, and they both have Great Britain keeping a bad eye on them. Now, there's Great Britain. Great Britain, I'll just call them Great Britain, the British Empire, they had been on Russia's case since 1815. They defeated Napoleonic France, the big threat to Europe. And then Russia said, hey, how about all of us European countries get together and make a big alliance to stop any revolutions around the world, meaning Europe? And the British told them, no, we don't need to be in a holy alliance. The Russians thought, well, that's not good. Because you see, the British were not about to share power with anybody. If anybody was going to run anything, it was going to be the people in London, not somebody in St. Petersburg, Russia, the capital of Russia. So now it's Moscow, of course, but... So they were turned down. And then Russia noticed that every time some, some conflict broke out, the British would come and team up against them. So it was very clear by 1853 that the British had a bad eye on Russia. They were working to hurt Russia, which explains why they were so foolish to team up with France. <laughs> okay, because France after 1815 was more or less a second tier lackey of the British Empire. In other words, the French were not strong like they used to be, and they never really were that strong. They had a history of losing more or less every war they ever got involved in. I could show you that example. So <laughs> here you are with the British who have a bad eye on you. In other words, they, they are working against your best interest. 
meaning when I say you, I mean Russia. And they got a junior partner, France, who sort of runs behind them as a second tier lackey in a way. You say, that sounds terrible to say that. It does sound terrible to say it, but it's the truth. Now, a lot of French resented that, but uh, they weren't in a position to do a whole lot else. Well, they were in a position to do something. They could have been neutral and just cut their losses and say, well, we lost Alsace and Lorraine. Let's just forget about it. But they can't do it. You know, they're so prideful. The French people are so prideful, so they can't do it. They got to get them. But you see, pride leads to a fall. The Bible says pride precedes a fall. Okay. So here you are, Russia. You're going to team up with France, who's the junior partner of Great Britain. Well, naturally, Great Britain's going to get involved in an unofficial sense. Like, well, and they had some unofficial agreements. Well, you see, uh, we'll just monitor the situation, of course. But if anything ever happens, we'll, we'll, uh, use our best judgment and, and, and look at how to uh, deal with, with whatever situation arises. So what they called this arrangement was the triple entente, entente, French word meaning triple kind of agreement, sort of speak. United Kingdom, France, and Russia. Not exactly an alliance, but a kind of a, a we got a little loose partnership. France and Russia in an actual alliance. Why does that make Germany paranoid? Okay. Well, <clears throat> before 1871, Germany was looked at as sort of a joke. Economically, not a joke, because they were growing very quickly as an economic power, but a military power, a joke, because um, they were always squabbling, all the German states, and uh, they just had internally had a lot of issues going on, and they weren't any threat to anybody, that's for sure, they weren't a threat to invade anybody. Uh, but then in 1871, they were united as the German Empire the new German empire, because they had one before up until 1806. And they got their emperor, William, and by 1914, William II, Hohenzollern, the Hohenzollern dynasty. So he was the German emperor. Germany noticed that the stronger they got, the less friendly Great Britain became. Now, Germany started to follow a very unwise policy. The, the policy was to copy the other countries. They had a un, they had unity. They had one flag now, the red, white, and black flag. One central government in Berlin, a very democratic country, actually, compared to most of the European countries, even England. Uh, and uh, it, it had a growing economy and a, a very powerful and growing even more powerful economy. But they got this idea that the only way they could make it in the world, it was a foolish idea, was to build a big navy and a big army. They didn't have airplanes at the time, so that's later. So Germany goes on this spending spree to build a huge navy and a huge army, <clears throat> imperial navy and army. Now, the British got very uneasy about that because the British attitude was, well, why do you need a big army and a big navy? There's no one planning to invade you. And the Germans said, well, you know, you never know what France might try because they don't like us even though we really want to have peace with them. We got the land back that they stole from us. We want to have peace, but we know they plot against us all the time. Tell you the truth. And so the British say, no, um, we just don't feel comfortable. I'm, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, you understand. <laughs> I'm using a lot of quotes and I'm paraphrasing them. But that attitude was, we don't feel comfortable the way you get in this big Navy and army. Now, the German attitude was, well, you have one. Don't you have a big navy all around the world, the world's biggest navy? Not a big army, but you have a big navy. 
and you have colonies all over the world. So what are you worried about? So the Germans didn't didn't really feel comfortable with the British having this anti-German vibe that they were getting from them, which is even a bigger reason why Germany and Russia should, if any, if Germany was going to make an alliance with anyone, it should have been with Russia. You see what I'm saying? Do you understand what the point I'm making? Russia already had the British on their case. And even today in 2022, see, it's been going on since 1815, all right? It's been over 200 years they've been on their case. And here's Germany and the British are on their case, but who did they team up with? Not Russia. Well, they couldn't now because Russia had teamed up with France. So it really starts with France and Russia. That's why I said we got to go back to France. They're angry because of something that happened in 1871 and they can't let it go. And see, when people can't let stuff go, it leads to trouble. You see what I'm saying? So this is the first big problem. France makes an alliance with Russia in the 1890s. It's sort of like dominoes and you knock one over and it leads to a domino effect. Germany feeling paranoid about this decides to make an alliance with their old enemy, Austria-Hungary. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's look at Austria and Hungary a dual country, literally a country ruled by two countries, the Austrian Empire here, the Grand Duchy of Austria, who rules everything from Lviv, Lviv in Ukraine today, by the way, it's part of Ukraine today, Krakow in Poland today. See where Lviv is? Lviv or Limburg, as it was called by the Austrians. Limburg, Ostrava, Prague, Linz, Pressburg, Vienna, Pressburg, which is now Bratislava, Budapest, which was Hungary. Now, all this area down here in the south, Kulj, Napuka, that's all Hungarian territory. Mixkok, that's all Hungarian. They had independence. Hungary was an independent country in the sense that they had their own parliament, their own flag, their own king, who was also the Austrian Grand Duke, Francis Joseph. But Hungary had their own laws and Austria did not rule Hungary. They were a dual alliance. It was two independent countries that worked in concert in cooperation to rule this whole yellow area. They had no overseas territory, so there's no use discussing that. Okay. This is a country that had never won a war. I'm telling you, never. <laughs> Except, you know, when they had expelled the Turks with everybody's help. I mean, when the Turks were besieging Vienna in 1680s, uh, Poland helped them. So uh, Austria-Hungary, anytime they went out to fight somebody, they always lost. They're kind of like, you know, a movie casino, like Remo, a, a, a degenerate gambler who always lost, you know, and it's just, it's, and it kind of, it kind of makes sense because Austria-Hungary was a country, they never learned, like they always fought wars and they always lost. They used to own Belgium. It was called the Austrian Netherlands. Of course, they lost that. <laughs> they used to own Lombardy in Venetia, northern Italy, Lombardy in Venetia after Napoleon was defeated. Well, of course, they lost that to Italy. Uh, they used to own southern Silesia, but of course, they lost that to Germany, Prussia specifically. So here's Germany an up-and-coming country, and they're going to team up with Austria-Hungary, a powerful country economically. They had a, you know, they were a, a world power in an economic sense. Militarily, horrible. So how is that going to help Germany to team up with a country that cannot win? Well, you know the answer to that question. It can't help them, and it won't help them. Now they bring in a third country, Italy a new kid on the block as well, who also has a history of doing terrible in wartime, but of course Italy wasn't even a united country until 1860. But even in the past, uh, well, aside from the when Venice used to be its own maritime naval power, and who was pretty powerful, Venice used to be a country, uh, Italy didn't have a track record of being too too terrific. You say, yeah, well, what about the Roman Empire? Yeah, well, okay, yeah. If you go back to uh, 
the ancient world. Okay, but we're not we 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 we're far removed from that. All right. And now we got these new countries down here: Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, Albania, and Greece, who had all broken away from the Turks starting in the 1830s. Uh, all the way to 1912. Albania didn't Albania didn't get independence from Turk Turkey, the Ottoman Turks, until 1912. So it went on for nearly 100 years. Cyprus was occupied by the British uh, from the Turks. Uh, so uh, let's look at the situation, and then we're going to close out. We've got these countries down here in Southeastern Europe, Romania, Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, Albania, Montenegro. Who, Montenegro wanted nothing except to be left alone, so we can't blame them. Albania wanted nothing but to be left alone, so we certainly cannot blame them. However, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, and Greece had their eye on other people's lands, and that is a recipe for trouble. The Ottoman Empire, on the other hand, their only goal was to keep what they had when there wasn't a whole lot. You see Kuwait over here, and you see uh, Qatar, Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman, the Trucial State. That was all under British protection. So the British had the the British controlled the Persian Gulf, the British controlled the Red Sea, the British controlled the Mediterranean Sea, and the Ottoman Empire controlled what they had in brown, or whatever that color is, brownish, gray color. And, and, and they, they want to keep what they have, which seems to be shrinking about every two or three years. And Italy controls the Dodecanese Islands, which they captured from the Turks in 1911 and 1912 during the Italian-Turkish War. They attacked, Tur they attacked Turkey, took the Dodecanese Islands and Libya, Tripolitania, but Libya. <laughs> okay, so we're going to close this out. But just, just remember in part one, the Ottomans... They want nothing to change because they want to keep what they have. Russia wants nothing to change. They want to keep what they have, and they really don't have any ambition to grab anymore. And they have a lot of massive internal problems in 1914. So the czar wants things to stay the same. Okay, no change, status quo. So Russia, no change. Ottoman Empire, they want no changes. Austria-Hungary, they want no changes because they're a weak country and they want to keep what they have in yellow and they're not too sure they're going to be able to do it. That is a question that when they ask the question, they don't like the answer. So uh, it's kind of shaky. They were definitely one of the shakier countries in Europe. <clears throat> but still holding together, 1914, still holding together. They've been hold they're one of the oldest empires in Europe since the Middle Ages, the, the Habsburgs. So didn't not like it used to be. They didn't still have Belgium and uh, Italian states, but uh, not terrible, but not good. Germany, they wanted nothing to change. Status quo. They got a huge empire and they don't want to lose it. There isn't any prospect that it's going to get bigger, really. So they're satisfied for it to stay like it is. So they don't want any changes. Switzerland doesn't matter because they're neutral and they want, they want to be left alone. Belgium is neutral, wants to be left alone. Luxembourg, neutral, wants to be left alone. Netherlands, neutral, wants to be left alone. Denmark, neutral, wants to be left alone. Kingdom of Sweden, neutral, wants to be left alone. The Kingdom of Norway, neutral, wants to be left alone. We'll go over here for a couple more minutes. The United Kingdom. They want no changes. They got a huge empire around the world, the biggest in the history of the world. <clears throat> they got the world's largest navy and the world's biggest economy, but the United States is uh, pretty much ca caught up with them at that point. But still, they're living large, making tons of money. They want no changes. They know they're going to have to make some changes because the Irish are in a virtual uprising against them every day of the week. So they say, we're going to let the Irish be like Canada and have self-government. And that's the plan in 1914. So they're telling the Irish, okay, you can have self-government eventually in the next year or two. We're going to do that. So you can be like Canada and Australia and New Zealand and South Africa and have your own self-government, you know, your own home government. But not quite yet because there's some 
kind of uh, difficult details that have to be worked out, but we're working for that. Okay, so that's the situation. They know they're going to have to change in that sense, give Ireland home rule, what they called home rule, but it would still be part of the British uh, realm, you know, King uh, George's realms, but uh, but uh, self-governing. Okay, <clears throat> France, they want changes. They have a huge empire and they want more, specifically Alsace and Lorraine, and there's only one way to get it. If they ever catch Germany slipping, they can get Russia to hit Germany from the east and get their land back. That sounds about like the most, <clears throat> that sounds like about the riskiest option ever, right? But uh, that's what you call gambling, right? Gambling with your life, but I uh, guess they had no good sense. Monaco, they're a micro state. Of course, they want no changes. They're the size of uh, Manhattan or uh, the Bronx uh, County. Spain is weak. Can't win a war, never did, and they want no changes. They have a small empire and they want to keep it. Portugal, they have a small empire and they want to keep it, and they're not powerful and they don't want any changes. So who are the countries that want to change things? France. Italy. They have a te they have territory and they want more. And what territory is it? Well, in the north and in the east but that would bring them into conflict with Austria-Hungary. So you say, well, why would they make an alliance with Austria-Hungary? That's a wonderful question. And it's uh, it makes no sense. So Italy is gonna team up with Austria-Hungary, a country they have nothing in common with and who they actually don't even like and want land from them. And they're gonna team up with Germany, a country they have nothing in common with and that's their triple alliance. And you can say to yourself, just like I'm saying to myself, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. Three countries are going to team up. Two of the countries don't even like each other. And there's only one strong country in the alliance, and that's Germany. So you might ask yourself, how in the world can Austria-Hungary and Italy help Germany if they're not strong? On paper, Italy was strong. On paper, Italy had a strong navy and a strong army. Yeah, well, Russia is supposed to have a strong navy and army too on paper, but how's that working out in Ukraine? Is it really that strong or is it the same old story of they seem to be strong, but, it, but their performance level doesn't pan out, right? So that's Italy's problem. On paper, they seem to be strong, but they haven't fought a major war. And so the question is, are they really going to be strong? France does have a huge army, a very powerful navy, but they are second rate in a sense, and that's why they tag along behind Great Britain. So here's Great Britain. They mainly, their goal is to just keep running everything, okay? Because they had been pretty much running the show, meaning the world, since about 1688, 1689. And they're intended to continue to do that. You say, what about the United States? What about the United States? The United States uh, <clears throat> was neutral at this time and not involved in any of this. Although the United States was very clearly in cahoots with the British establishment. So the British establishment and the United States, New York City establishment, Washington, D.C. establishment were very closely in cahoots and had been collaborating since the days of the Monroe Doctrine in the 1820s. So that has to be considered that they're not, you got to keep in mind that they, 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 they uh, unofficially in the back doors, in the back rooms, they plot together with the, the British taking the lead and the Americans following the lead. So that's a dangerous problem there. And we know how that works out. Okay, so that's the setup. Now, when we go to part two one day, soon, maybe, hopefully, we're going to see how it all shakes down, and then we can say, who's to blame? Who's to blame? <clears throat> now, let's see if we got any comments. Uh...
Liam Gillespie says France, December 25th, 1914. Okay, you're talking about chemical weapons. Fox News would love this. Okay, well, they probably wouldn't like it as a continue. Serbia is to blame. Weren't they the ones to move troops to the Austrian border? Nice to see you back in history talks. Ron says vicious rage. Oh, well, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Serbia, we're going to definitely talk about Serbia. You sound well in French. Do you speak it? Uh, I don't really speak French. GHX into the world said, I thought this was a beer channel. Now history class. What the fool? I know you're a teacher. World War III soon. Well, the channel's not called Beer Channel. It's just my name. I have Louisiana Beer Reviews on the channel. It's not the whole channel. I've been doing history videos for 10 years. The Whiskey Scout. Austria-Hungary had horrible weaponry, use old designs, and getting whipped on the battlefield. Yep, that's right, Matt. And you're going to team up with them. Thumbs down. Thumbs down for what? They were superior at the time. They were using French bases. Uh, I'm not aware of them using any French bases. The British had naval bases all over the world. Uh, they definitely had the de best navy in the world, definitely, isn't it? With a, without a doubt. In the First World War and World War Part II in 1939. So that's without question. And we're going to see if that's going to make a big difference. Germany plus every member of the Triple Entente share most of the blame, says Brusco. Additionally, Austria-Hungary for setting off the first place. Well, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that in the next installment, Part Two. So we're going to see. And everybody, if anybody feels strongly enough about it, they can join the discussion, you know. I'll put a link. But then... We want to keep it rolling, you know. I don't want somebody to join and they go on and on all day. Although they might might be incredible to listen to. They might have great things to say. Who knows? All right. Well, thanks for watching. Y'all take care now. We'll be back soon enough for which country is to blame for World War One Part Two.